friends, I hope you enjoyed the wonderful surprise of being able to sing along with our own worship team. And uh, obviously a virtual song. Lovely to see their faces, to hear their voices, and to know that you and I could sing along with them this morning too. Good morning. Lovely to be with you again. Thank you for joining with me. And to please remember, the invitation to worship with me this morning involves communion at the end of our service time. I hope you have your bread and your glasses of water handy nearby. And uh, that will be the end and the focal point of our service this morning. Thank you too for your tithes and your offerings and the generosity of your giving. We really are able to continue doing all that we need to do as a church. And that really is very precious, not just for us, obviously, but for the community that we serve. So thank you so much for all that you're doing to support the work of the church. And remember, the banking details for your tithes and your gifts are on the website www.platmethodist.co.za and just below the sermon video link for the week you'll find the bank details there. I thought to lead us into our worship time it would be wonderful to have a prayerful song and so we're going to have the Don Moen version of the Lord's Prayer and I invite you to sing prayerfully and quietly with me as we move into our worship time together now too. Hear our prayer We are your children And we've gathered here Today is we We've gathered here To pray Hear our cry Lord we need your mercy And we need your grace Today yes we do us as we pray.
wonderful way for us to move into our worship time together. So I'm going to ask Paul now with that wonderful radio voice to lead us with our reading for today. And it's Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. So Paul stood up in front of the council and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious. As I was going through your city and looking at the things you worship, I found an altar with the words, To an unknown God. You worship this God, but you don't really know him. So I want to tell you about him. This God made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He doesn't need help from anyone. He gives life, breath, and everything else to all people. From one person, God made all nations who live on earth, and he decided when and where every nation would be. God has done all this so that we look for him and reach out and find him. He isn't far from any of us, and he gives us the power to live, to move, and to be who we are. We are his children, just as some of your poets have said. Since we are God's children, we must not think that he is like an idol made out of gold or silver or stone. He isn't like anything that humans have thought up and made. In the past, God forgave all this because people did not know what they were doing. But now he says that everyone everywhere must turn to him. He has set a day when he will judge the world's people with fairness, and he has chosen the man Jesus to do the judging for him. God has given proof of this to all of us by raising Jesus from death. Thank you so much, Paul. We're going to have a time of singing together now. Uh, Hillsong will lead us in the song Mighty to Save. And in the, the whole idea that God can move mountains, and even though he's this God of power and majesty around us, the God who can move who we are with inside us and still engage with us at the very core of our beings. Come on, let's sing together. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. The mercy for all me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior.
And so friends, to move into our message for this week, just a brief recap. Remember last week we looked at the idea of you and I are the temple of the living God. We said it in another way too. We said we are the living temple in whom God lives and resides. And so this week I'd like to take that thinking a little bit further and ask you to think about who you are living out your life in your identity, who is in Jesus. Might sound a little cumbersome to say that, but our identity, who you and I are, is in Jesus. That's what we're going to explore this week. And I thought, you know, in our South African context, uh, we are seen to exist, we are seen to live, uh, we are seen to have a, a right to be who we are in the country if we are registered with our ID, for example. So we have an ID card, maybe you've got the old ID book, uh, maybe you've got a driver's license, so you have to have a card to register that you're allowed to drive, but on there's your ID number as well. Uh, how about the bank card? And uh, I'm being careful so I don't flash my bank card number at you on the internet. But at the top of my card is that little chip. And unless that chip is there and I have a PIN number in that chip, then this bank card, for example, uh, is not connected to me. But then we go even further, don't we? And we talk about our mobile phones. That we, are even have an, we even have an identity on our mobile phone. And on the phone, it's a fingerprint recognition or there's facial recognition or there's a PIN number or a password. And all these identifiers help to prove who we are or to say we have an identity. And without them, and in our South African context, for example, without our birth certificate, we can't apply for our ID book. And without our ID book, we can't get employment or a bank account. Uh, we can't work. And we know that there are many thousands of South Africans living, moving, walking around, but desperate because as far as the system is concerned, they don't have this documentation, therefore they don't exist. We are identified by the cards and so on that we have. Now thinking along that sort of line, I wondered if you've ever had this philosophical tease question come your way before. How can you prove that you really do exist. Have you ever thought about that? Can you prove that you are real, that you're not just the figment of someone else's imagination or someone else's dream? Can you prove that you are here? Now, in our responses to a philosophical teaser like that, we might say, well, of course, there are people around me that see me. There are people that interact with me. There are people that tell me I am here. But that's not the point of the question, is it? You and I need to think about how we prove our identity as living beings. It's quite an interesting exercise to, to have and to think about that this week. How do you prove your existence? Now, Rene Descartes, who lived from 1596 to 1650, was a French philosopher and a mathematician, and he was part of the debate and the discussion around this very issue so long ago. And he came up with his solution, and it was this, and you might have heard it before, it's a well-known phrase now, I think, therefore I am. Or another way of looking at that is, I exist because I have the ability to think about thinking. I have a, a consciousness. Now, Paul, the apostle in Athens, was a very highly skilled intellectual philosopher, debater, orator. He knew his business. And so our little philosophical exercise now needs, I needed to use that to help us put for Paul in the frame and context of who he is in his time, in our Bible reading for this week. And I wondered, too, putting Paul in that philosophical context, whether you and I have given much thought in our histories with the Lord, in our faith journeys, whether we've ever thought about how God is seen to exist within different cultures, or how God's message, perhaps, is received and accepted within different cultures and different contexts. 
I think you and I are often guilty of believing that the way we see God from within our own personal history is the way God is to be seen. A big learning curve for me at university was the need to learn to accept that the gospel was understood, uh, was expressed in different ways, within different cultures, within different languages, within different personalities, individual personalities too, within different contexts. And I, I come to an understanding of that, said to me, Tim, you need to learn that there is no one absolutely original, unadulterated, unchanged understanding of the gospel anywhere. Now at university, the intellectual shockwave that this sort of discovery caused in my class meant that many of the students that were studying with me, studying theology with me at, at university, left the course altogether. A substantial number of those that left the, 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 the studying for theology lost their faith too. There is no one correct cultural, no one correct intellectual or spiritual package for the gospel message that exists outside of the influence of human language and cultural expressions. You and I approach the message of Jesus from within our own framework. Uh, I'm sure that if we had to look at the message of Jesus from a purely intellectual, dry, philosophical place, that would be deadly for our faith. And the Apostle Paul lived, in fact, he'd grown up and trained, and he lived in this environment of the intellectual of the philosophical, and the thinking in this time was called Gnosticism. And so he understood the dynamics of all of that. And so let's get back to Paul now, the skilled orator and debater, the one who knows all about this intellectual discipline of the places, the centers of study and learning in his day. And so our reading that Paul, not the Apostle Paul now, the other Paul, read for us, took place in the intellectual center of the known world at the time. Athens was a very religious place. And within Athens was that curiosity that fuels the journey of any inquiring mind. There was debate. There was the development of groundbreaking new ideas. And all of this process was highly valued. And B.W. Johnson wrote about that too. He said, we must remember that this address of Paul was spoken in the literary capital of the ancient world, the most cultured city of the earth to which every Roman who sought a finished education resorted to to complete his studies. The home of the philosophers, orators, sculptors, painters and poets, and the great university where many thousands of strangers were gathered for study. That's the context of our reading. That's the audience that Paul is about to address for us. Now Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, tells us of this intellectual context in a fun way. Verse 21. Now I'm going to read it for you again. It goes like this. More than anything else, the people of Athens and the foreigners living there love to hear and to talk about anything new. So the Apostle Paul knows these things. He's seen all of this in action. He understands this context. He's been walking through this particular city now for quite a while, seeing what's been going on. And he's got to this point now where he cannot hold back any longer. And I sometimes wonder about Paul and his common sense. And he was a courageous man. He'd been thrown out of two major cities already because of the way that he expressed his radical ideas. And yet here now in this particular city, he can't hold back any longer. And so verse 22 says, So Paul stood up in front of the council and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious. 
And so the intellectuals, the Council of Areopagus, are now waiting with this enthusiastic participation to hear what he's about to say, to get into debate and discussion with him. And then Paul carries on and uh, he sets the table for his address by showing his intellectual credentials off to them. And how does he do that? Well, he quotes two Greek poets to his elite crowd. So we refer now to verse 28. Paul said this, For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Now you might not be aware, but that sentence in him we live and move and have our being is from Epimenides, a poet who lived about 600 years before Jesus. And then that sentence, we are his offspring, comes from the poet Aratus, who lived about 300 years before Jesus. So in this very articulate and clever manner, Paul gets the audience's attention, and they all agree with him, obviously. Their own poets have made these statements. He's proven what the poets have said. And what is that? Well, gods, deities, don't live inside manufactured things. Verses 24 and 25. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. And his audience would be saying, yes, of course, of course. Everyone knows better than that. And Paul is outlining again for his audience that the handmade pagan gods have their limits. But the real God is found in all the natural order and living in human beings. So in other words, where Paul begins to shift this argument and you and I are going to think about this this week. Paul is saying, if you peg your identity, if you peg how you understand who you are in something that is manufactured, like a manufactured God, or in our examples, like simply a cultural, political system in your day, in your day if you peg your identity to the manufactured thing, then you have a problem. Your identity is to be found in the living God who is all around you and within you. And in my imagination, maybe the audience are nodding enthusiastically now. Perhaps there's some pl applause at the point, at this point, hey? Yes, yes, we can agree with that. Good stuff. Keep going, Paul. Keep going. And you see, Paul is not saying anything controversial yet. Up to the end of verse 30. And then in verse 31, everything changes. The direction is shifted completely. And in verse 31, Paul talks about the need for repentance, that there is judgment with this God and, wow, resurrection, resurrection of the spirit and even of the body. And the audience of Paul in his day would have struggled so to hear what he was saying now and to accept that. After all, they would be saying to Paul in their intellectual space, after all, Paul, it's how you think that really matters. Your body, really irrelevant. Your mind is the key. It's about how you think. What do you mean, what do you mean about how you live in, within your body as well? But Paul, we discover, cannot preach about Jesus, cannot share faith about Jesus without preaching about the resurrection of who Jesus is. The resurrection of Jesus himself. And that is the nub of our message for this week. That statement of fact that Paul makes in verse 31 is no less true for us today as it was for him in his time. Our faith is rooted in Jesus and our identity as people. And our spiritual identity is not does not rest in a manufactured thing. Our identity and our spiritual identity is in the resurrection life of who Jesus is. Now this way of thinking, this idea, 
blew the minds of the Athenians living, to, living with Paul, listening to him then. And this idea of the resurrection body and the resurrection spirit also blows the minds for many people today. So even within our modern context, perhaps I suppose with the rise of science as the elite discipline, maybe even more so today, the idea of the resurrection and the resurrection body is ridiculed and rejected. But friends, the idea of who Jesus is and our identity in him as the resurrected Jesus is the truth that we need to hold on to in our faith today. That is where our identity comes from. You and I need to embrace more and more the truth of who Jesus is within the reality of our different cultural and language and economic contexts. You and I might be different within the contexts of our personal histories, but we all have the same identity as children of God because of the resurrected Jesus within us and because of our faith in him. So we might be different in our packaging, but we are the same in our identity of Christ within us. Your identity is in the living and resurrected Jesus. He lives in you and is to be found all around you. You are so much more than you think you are. You are so much more, we would say, than the sum of your parts. You are a child of the living God and your identity is in him. So think about this personal identity in Jesus this week and please think about personal identity next time you are with a teenager who's struggling to find his or her own understanding of identity in their developmental, developmental stage of their growth. Think about an identity in Jesus when you are faced with that enormous challenge of feeding thousands and thousands of very hungry people. Think about the identity in Jesus when you are caring for the sick, when you are reaching out to the homeless, when you are with someone who is trapped in a sick bed. They are so much more than that. Think about the identity in Jesus, when you are with someone whose mind is beginning to break with dementia, or with someone whose mind is trapped inside a body that no longer works. Think about the identity of Jesus and the identity in Jesus and you being identified with who Jesus is and the other in moments like that. Think deeply about these things. And then remember, it's not just about the thinking. It's about the deciding to take the step of faith like Paul does with the Athenians. He's saying to them, you might understand these things, but I need you to move in faith to this way of thinking and living and of being. William Loder put it wonderfully. He wrote this and I'm going to read a paragraph for you now. He says, the vision of the kingdom is our agenda. The spirit of the kingdom is our enabling. The grace which lived and died and rose for us in Jesus feeds our souls. We are the church. God's risk of love in history. God's promise of the kingdom for now so let us rejoice in the freedom of the spirit that knows no bounds, that leads us beyond our fears and our barriers to the uttermost ends of the world. And that brings us back to the center, to the word of God, born witness to and by Holy Scripture. God in whom we live and move and have our being 
and whose family we are. And so we quote again those ancient poets that lived long before Jesus lived. God in whom we live and move and have our being and whose family we are. I invite you to pray through this this week. You are so much more than you believe you are. You are a child of the living God. A song to lead us now to our time of communion together, but to help us to pray through what we've heard. The song, New Wine. And the crushing And the pressing Friends, we're going to share in communion together now. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer, a prayer of consecration of our elements. And I invite you where you are just to join me in the prayer. 
then I'll break the bread here and Jane and I will share uh, the sacrament together and I invite you obviously to do that at home. If you're on your own, feel our prayers and our thoughts with you. And if you are with your family, be blessed too in this time of breaking bread together. And so let's pray together. And Father, as we come to this moment now of the breaking of bread and the sharing of, of the wine, we thank you for that moment that Jesus shared with the disciples in the upper room. We thank you for the intimacy. We thank you, Father, for the faith. We thank you for the power and the grace in that moment. As he reached out to them and he said to them, Whenever you do these things, when you break the bread, when you drink the wine, remember me. And we understand, Father, from within our context, looking back to Jesus through the empty tomb and the pain of the cross, what he meant by remember me. And so together today we remember him, we thank you for all that Jesus means for us. We thank you for the gift of grace, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for the love of God through Jesus that sets us free. So be with us now. And as we break bread and drink the wine, may we feel you at work within us. For we are your children and you are the living God who lives within each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. So now we take the bread and we break it. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. Thank you, Jesus, for living in us. And we are so grateful. Amen. Can we take... Jane and I are using water and we take our glass now and as we drink, we remember the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for us. And we are grateful. Amen. Amen. So friends, thank you for joining with us this morning. And uh, we pray that you'll be blessed this week and we're going to say the benediction together and then we'll be singing our song as we leave our worship time and move into the week that lies ahead. And so say it with me now. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Shalom, my friend, shalom, my friend.